Okay, thank you so much. So guys, here I'm introducing you Chris Bennett. He has written several books on cannabis and we are very grateful to have him on the show. So welcome to the show, Chris. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been researching the role of cannabis in magic and religion specifically for about 30 years. I've written four books on this, Green Gold, the Tree of Life, Marijuana and Magic and Religion, uh, which came out in 1995, Sex, Drugs, Violence in the Bible, which came out in 2001, Cannabis and the Soma Solution, which came out in 2010, and more recently, uh, Liber 420, Cannabis Magical Herbs in the Occult, which came out in 2018. Uh, so I've looked at cannabis you know, in a variety of cultures throughout history. Uh, up into modern times. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, you are like ocean of knowledge about cannabis and we are very blessed to have you on the show. So my, the intention of the show is cause to tell people that legalization will not end the civilization of humans. It was, it was openly consumed by Scythians around 2,500 years ago. So please tell us a little bit about Scythians. What kind of people were they? Well, Scythians is kind of a blanket term for a, a variety of Indo-European tribes uh, that came out of the Russian steppes, but uh, they expanded into northern India, into central China, into Europe, uh, uh, and throughout the Middle East as well because of uh, their high... Uh, high nomadic nature. They were uh, horseback riders, amongst the first horseback riders. In fact, horseback riding itself uh, was uh, uh, thought to have uh, started with uh, uh, the Scythian's ancestors, the Serdeni Stog, a proto-Indo-European group out of uh, around Ukraine region. Um, and it's thought that uh, the domestication of the horse itself only took place because of uh, the development of hemp ropes. And it's interesting because this same region, uh, um, going back about 5,500 years, the Ukraine, is where we find the first evidence of people burning hemp and inhaling the fumes in the form of a polypod bowls uh, found in a cave in the Ukraine, pointed to by the British archaeologist Andrew Sharat. Oh, thank you. Nice to know that. And the museum, so they held Scythian, like how do they smoke hemp, throw yeah. people off hemp seeds. Yeah, they had a, Her Herodotus, the Greek historian, wrote about this as well. And uh, um, then later on, uh, the uh, Soviet archaeologist, um, in 1945, found the actual implements that were described by Herodotus. And what the Scythians would do is they would heat up rocks in a fire, and then they would place these rocks in a bronze brazier. And then they would take this brazier, and they would put it inside a teepee-like tent structure. Mm -hmm. And then they would throw cannabis on the hot rocks, vaporizing it and creating fumes, which were contained in the tent, and then they'd open the, 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 the cover of the tent and stick their head in and inhale the fumes because uh, pipes and uh, uh, um, joints and uh, other smoking implements that we use in this modern day uh, were never actually a part of uh, cannabis use until after the discovery of the New World and the discovery of uh, tobacco smoking and the various implements used in tobacco smoking. So this was kind of what we would call today a hot box type of situation. Okay. And the Scythians also drank cannabis. They infused it with wine. Um, here's actually a uh, um, here's actually a uh, bowl. I mean, a, not a bowl, a bag, a leather uh, a bag that was wow. used to hold cannabis infused wine by the Scythians. And uh, more recently, National Geographic has uh, uh, written about the discovery of golden goblets uh, okay. um, used by the Scythians to drink a preparation that contained both cannabis and opium, seeded buds onto, onto the heated rocks, and then uh, um, through decomposition, stuff like that, all that we're left with is a carbonized uh, seed remains. Uh, um, sometimes a bit of carbonized uh, chaff as well from the cannabis. So how did they convert that bird to drinkables, like you, as you mentioned, they mix it with the wine. So what do they do? The leather bag that I showed, that was uh, thought to have been cannabis infused wine. Also, they found a cup with some remnants in it as well. The other one, it's less clear if it was like a, a wine drink. We just know that uh, residues of uh, cannabis and poppy uh, opium uh, were, were, were found in the golden goblets. And one of the Russian archeologists that is involved uh, with this discovery uh, uh, Professor Anton Gass, he has suggested that these were in fact uh, goblets used for the drinking of Hayoma, 
uh, oh. Haoma is the uh, Persian counterpart of the Vedic Soma, the, and then Haoma is the Avestan version. It's believed that Haoma and Soma originated earlier from the same Indo-European use of an identical sacrament. And this is interesting because there's been a lot of archaeological discoveries to back this up. And one of the names of the uh, Scythians, they're known by a variety of names in the ancient world, Sakas as well as what the Persians call them. But one of the nicknames of the Scythians was the Haoma Varga. That means the gatherers of the Haoma. This is the same as Soma. This is a very, very big thing in the ancient world. You know, like I would say of religious sacraments that we know about in the ancient world, this the identity of Soma and Haoma Yep. Uh, may in fact be the biggest mystery and the Scythians are wound up in this story because of their high mobility and I was talking uh, earlier about the braziers used by the Scythians to yep. uh, inhale yes. their cannabis from and interestingly uh, we have uh, recently in the last decade there's been a number of discoveries in central China uh, involving the Gushi culture now although this is in central China these are not the Han Chinese not the indigenous Chinese Yep. These were Indo-Europeans like the Scythians who had okay. ended up in China due to their high mobility. Yep. And recently we have found wooden braziers that are very identical in shape to the bronze braziers used by the Scythians. And they had very well preserved cannabis, female cannabis buds of very high TH content. And a mm. number of tombs uh, in this region have been discovered uh, um, that had uh, evidence of cannabis, like actual dried cannabis. They were very well preserved, female, uh, um, high, high THC cannabis. Uh, so this has really revolutionized what we, we know about trade in the ancient world as well, because these tribes in the Chinese region, uh, um, they were in high mobility through uh, trade routes uh, um, and are known to have been in trade with another region in Afghanistan, the Bactria Margiana Archaeological Con uh, Complex. And at this site, the Russian archaeologist, Victor Serianadi, says he has found three uh, um, football-sized temples dating back to 4,000 years ago. Wow. And that these temples were used for the preparation of this drink, Hayoma. That was, and, and what they found evidence of the site in residues, in tools used for making a sacred beverage there, were residues of cannabis, poppy, and ephedra. And ephedra is still used uh, uh, um, by Zoroastrian priests and also by Vedic priests uh, for drinking soma and haoma. And I suspect if they had checked for ephedra in the golden goblets of the Scythians, they likely would have found ephedra in that as well, along with the cannabis and poppy. So this is a very, you know, in my opinion, it's really shaping up, and, you know, and it's interesting because in China, the Han Chinese, their name for the cannabis that the Scythian culture was using, and specifically I'm talking about Scythian culture here, was Huma, means fire hemp. Mm -hmm. And Huma is linguistically connected to Haoma. And through linguistic changes, the, the language went through when it traveled into India, the Saoma became the Soma, which is the source of the Vedic religion. Yeah. And so here in this like pivotal time in history, we see this magnificent medicinal plant of the ancient world worshipped almost as a deity by the Avestans and the Vedic worshippers. Yeah. Returning, you know, we find this evidence of it, of it materially returning to us. Yeah, see the one more, uh, the thing that my community is worried really about, people think that it's going to make them lazy, that people won't go to work, like, because, but Scythians, they were fierce warriors. They traveled. They were oh, well, you know, people. take a look at the Nihang Sikhs. Are they lazy? Those guys are fierce warriors. You know? yeah, they're they always are. drinking Sukhadun, which is, is, is the cannabis. I should probably show you a couple things. This is like a Scythian figure. They were fully tattooed, both the men and women. And the women fought alongside the men. The, the yeah. term Amazon comes from actually the Scythian women uh, because they were such fierce warriors. And this is like a little uh, diorama of Scythians. They had full armor. They were the first to kind of wear pants. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, they were a very, very interesting culture. You know, they actually were even open to homosexuality. A lot of the priests were transvestites. But in regards to southern India, yeah. you know, in, in Indian culture, in mm -hmm. the northern uh, uh, Indian period from about 300 BC to about 380 is actually known as the Scythian period. And I'm going to show you something really remarkable. Sure. This is actually a third century coin, a Scythian coin from Northern India. Wow. It has a Scythian king 
dressed up as Shiva. He's got the trident there, and he's got a serpent around his neck, and he's holding yeah. the jar. Yeah. And on the back is, uh, you know, these are kind of worn because it's like a 1,700-year-old uh, coin, is Shiva yeah. and Nandi. And yeah. uh, the Scythians actually alternated between see the Shiva worship in northern India yeah. and Buddhist worship. And it's thought that Buddha himself was a, a Scythian prince oh, wow. uh, that was living in India when he had, you know, when, he, when, when his, his great uh, revelation took place. Around the rise of Buddhism that we see the prohibition of Soma and Haoma and other intoxicants, alcohol as well, meat eating and stuff like that in India. These weren't issues for the Vedic people. This is all has to do with the, with the rise of Buddhism. And that's where all this stuff fell by the wayside, came back later uh, when Hinduism rised up and uh, reclaim some of the Vedic heritage. But uh, Buddhism actually has a lot to do with the disappearance of this. As you mentioned, like Buddhism promoted or was it Buddhism banned these? Uh, banned. Although later Tibetan Buddhism, a lot of this stuff came back. Uh, um, we have stuff like the Mahakala Tantra and the Terra Tantra of Tibetan Buddhism, which is more shamanic uh, than, than the traditional Indian type of Buddhism, where cannabis is certainly used along with other intoxicants like Datura and Henbane and things like that. Why did they ban cannabis? Because they were really using it. You know, it was like really about like, you know, like with Buddhism, it just was so much about clarity and purity of thought. So a lot of stuff went by the wayside, uh, you know, meat eating as well as alcohol, right? And, and cannabis, I guess, got uh, lumped up all with that. And I think it's really just about the, the purity of just nothingness that is really at the core of, uh, of Buddhism. But uh, yeah, it's a complicated, it's a complicated topic. I, in my book, Cannabis and the Soma Solution, I go over a lot of the ancient material uh, um, um, regarding this uh, shift. And then also, you know, it wasn't completely banned. It was hard to get rid of. A lot of the banning had to do with the taxation and shit around it. Like they would have such heavy levies. And then every time you wanted to use any Soma, you would have to pay a Vedic priest basically to bless it properly. And so a lot of the whole Vedic ritual was really costing anybody who wanted to do anything, get married, uh, buy a cow, anything like that, uh, was wrapped up with all these complicated Vedic rituals. And Buddhism really put an end to all that in a big way. Uh, um, and uh, uh, when it came back as Hinduism, it wasn't nearly as complicated as it had become uh, uh, under Vedic and the, the religious forms of taxation uh, that they imposed on all areas of life. So how did then Buddhism like took over by Hinduism and then Hinduism opened cannabis openly consume people like people were consuming it openly? Well, I don't think it ever completely went away. Right. You know what I mean? Like it yeah. was definitely under Buddhist rule for a long time, but it must have been, you know, Vedic elements and Indian uh, um, traditional, more traditional uh, 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 Indian types of worship because uh, it, it didn't certainly come out of nowhere when it when it returned, I think, in, you know, probably around the 13th or 14th century. I'm not sure. I'm not like, I don't want to give people the the uh, uh, idea that I consider myself a historian of, of, of the Hindu religion or the Vedic religion or the Scythians or anything like that. I know a lot about, you know, where cannabis was used, and I've tried to understand enough about the cultures that I'm discussing uh, um, to put it into some sort of context. But... Uh, you know, the, the complicated history of uh, Hinduism and Buddhism and uh, Vedicism and, and how it all interwound and took place is, is beyond my ability to really lay out for you. But I have read one of your articles. Uh, it mentioned that Scythians have trigods and even uh, Vedic religion like Hinduism, they have trigods as well. So there are a couple of similarities. Oh, there's some similarities for sure. And like I said, the Scythian, you know, is like this broad term for a variety of uh, Indo-European tribes. And so different things are happening in different places. We're also talking about big stretches of time here as well, right? Yep. Um, so probably, you know, like, you know, like I was, I was mentioning the, the, the Indians, uh, I mean, the Scythians in Northern India, they were worshiping Shiva and shit like that, you know, pr yep. uh, from like 300 BC to 300 AD. Yep. Uh, um, but, you know, there's also like their, their main deity to worship was like Tabit Hestia or uh, uh, um, Rhea Krona. It's kind of like an earth mother goddess type of thing. But they also wor worshipped a lot of the Greek gods as well. You see uh, um, stuff about Hercules mixed up with the Scythians and Zeus mixed up with the Scythians. Yeah. And so it was, you know, 
back in these days of uh, polytheism, like we still see in India, it was a lot yeah. easier. There was no like rule about just worshiping one deity and, and stuff like that. So it was a lot of easier for people to blend cultures and religions. And even the Vedic, you know, even the modern Hindu religion, you know, it's thought to be that uh, Shiva and Kali, for instance, are indigenous uh, uh, um, um, deities. And then the Vedic deities came with the, uh, the Aryans that brought them with them. And uh, um, they all kind of now mix together, right? You know what I yeah, mean? And this yeah. is true of a lot of what was going on with the Scythians as they traveled in different places and mixed up with different cultures. Unfortunately, they had no written language. And so what we know about them is largely through the discovery of uh, Scythian tombs, uh, what the Greeks and other cultures, Persians wrote about them, and uh, 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 archaeological finds, that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I have, I have one, uh, one more thing uh, to ask you. Well, well, Scythians fought war with Persia for almost 30 years. So would, do they consume it before the war or after the war? Like in the oh, war, I would or, say you know, the, the Persians themselves, Zoroastrian religion, has a yeah. very, very interesting uh, history with cannabis. And oh, there oh. are direct references to cannabis in Zoroastrian texts under uh, uh, terms like uh, manga and banga. And, you know, the, 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 the Scythians of that region known as the Sakas, it's really hard to separate them from the wider Mazdian religion that uh, uh, Zoroastrianism grew out of. Zoroaster was kind of a monotheistic reformer that reformed the polytheistic Man Mazdian religion in a way, although, you know, it's kind of complicated that because there's the Ashaspentas, they're kind of like deities in a way, but it's generally consider considered more of a monotheistic religion uh, um, when people talk about it nowadays. But uh, in the Zoroastrian religion, uh, there was great, um, Zoroaster was a prohibitor of, of the uh, orgiastic rites around Haoma, but Haoma still survives in the Zoroastrian religion, but generally just as this uh, uh, preparation of a fedra. But in Zoroaster's own time, we see references to his wife, Avovi, praying that uh, she be given Zoroaster's good narcotic banga so that okay. she may think according to the law, speak according to the law, and act according to the law. And Zoroaster's first uh, convert, King Vishtaspa, yeah. is enlightened only after he drinks a cup of uh, uh, cannabis-infused, uh, wine-infused with, with banga. And uh, Ardu Virov has his otherworldly vision of heaven and hell after drinking three golden cups of uh, 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 of uh, banga mixed with wine. So this was some sort of potent, potent cannabis-infused wine. And so, you know, this use in Indo-European culture, as I mentioned, goes okay. way, way back, even before the Scythians. Like I was talking about the ancestors of the Scythians. That's 5,500 years ago. So it's wow. like... Uh, was 3,000 years before Herodotus was writing about them burning cannabis. The, yeah. the, the, the Indo-European use of cannabis was already taking place. In fact, the root word for cannabis yep. in, in the Indo-European languages, pro, it's actually Proto-Indo-European, even before there was the Indo-European languages from which we get Germany, French, English, Sanskrit, uh, the Avestan language, all these different languages originated yep. with this Indo-European languages. Even before that had developed and split off, we see the term kana. We see the term kana in Proto-Indo-European languages. And this an and kana is in shamvra, cannabis, banga, sana, the Sanskrit word, yeah. uh, countless uh, uh, other for you know other words that uh, of languages that developed out of the Indo-European language. So this is you know so far back in human history. Carl Sagan speculated that was humanity's first agricultural crop is so hemp. old. You know, evidence of, of the use of hemp for fiber, like in forms of cloth, go back 10,000 years in Kalaayak, 12,000 years in Taiwan. Uh, we found, according to the foremost authority on uh, um, ancient textiles, uh, Elizabeth Whalen Barber, we found tools used for breaking apart hemp dating back 25,000 years. Wow. Uh, um, wow. So... We're talking about, you know, like a plant that has been with humanity for 10,000 years. I would suggest that we have evolved together. And, uh, um, you know, we take a look at what's taking place in medicine. This is where I think the people of South Asia are really missing out. The prohibition and, and negative attitude in South Asia against this sacred plant is a remnant of the fucking British Raj. Absolutely. That's a fact. 
You know, that's, yeah. a, that's a cold, hard fact, man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they, they like totally prohibited and brainwashed the whole area about this herb. And yeah. you can go back and look at things like the yeah. Indian Hemp Drugs Commission, where big inquiries were happening in the, in the 19th century uh, on how to deal with cannabis. And this is laid out as a plain fact. And all this prejudice against it, man. Cannabis is always celebrated, man. It's always been part of the Holy Festival. It's yeah. always been part of the Kumbha Mela. It's yeah. always been a part of Shiva Ratri. And those yeah. who speak against this Holy plant commit a great sin and error and insult yeah. Shiva. And British, they have to fight opium wars with China because yeah. they are profiting from opium. Yeah, Why yeah, would yeah. they let cannabis grow, right? Because it's against the economy. That's what they were in, in India for to make money and that's what they did pretty good yeah for them, yeah they did a terrible you know it's like what they're doing western cultures doing all over the world we see it still happening today i, I was reading somewhere too that scythians they were the third child of the world's strongest man hercules is that yeah. true or well you know I, 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 there's this mythology <laughs> we cannot do the dna test on them. <laughs> in the sense that hercules you know there was, was a guy and stuff like that i don't know i, I kind of doubt it you know these are all mythologies um, in the ancient world so i'm not you know i'm not going to look at a, a myth like that as some sort of historical fact but we might learn some stuff about the myths like for instance the scythians worshipped hercules uh, a, a deity worshipped in uh, greece as the son of zeus the king of the gods you know so there's a big parallels you know between uh, um the greek gods and the vedic gods and stuff like that if you really start to break down and look at it some of these figures may have originated uh, um from from identical earlier uh, uh, incarnations of these gods uh, with, with even earlier cultures that were the offshoots of. And uh, I think the further we look back, that we can see it's a universal world of man out there and we're all kind of connected. It, it was even mentioned in the book, A Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. And he draws so many similarities like it was just mind blowing that Greek culture and Hinduism and then that part of the world, they have so many similarities. About Absolutely. The heroes, you know, about when the Alexander stories. went into India, um, the worshippers of Dionysius yeah. and the worshippers of Shiva recognized yeah. each other as brothers and embraced. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, there's some evidence that Dionysius and Shiva are the same God. Uh, originating go. out of an earlier Indo-European uh, type of thing, uh, they're connected somehow. Uh, so, yeah, so do, is there any difference back in the days uh, between cannabis and hemp? Because now they say, okay, hemp is fiber, it's you know, hemp is like, you know, Indian that. hemp, that is actually a term come up with by Robert Hooke to distinguish the inert uh, um, uh, hemp that they had in Europe from okay. psychoactive hemp that they were bringing over in the 16th, 17th century into Europe because, okay. and, and so hemp is just like another name for cannabis. And this whole idea that hemp doesn't contain THC, this is something of the modern industrial era. You know what I mean? Hemp is just another word for cannabis. Yep. Indian hemp specifically was uh, uh, um, thought up to differentiate the more potent psychoactive varieties in much the same way we use cannabis indica now. Uh, okay. um, and cannabis sativa. That was also a, a, a terms that were come up. In fact, in Mexico, uh, um, marijuana was come up to designate cannabis indica over mm -hmm. cannabis, which was more the industrial type of hemp and, and, and cannabis that we were doing there. So it, the, the distinction is purely a modern one. And, uh, you know, we can't use those terms for that kind of a distinction in the ancient world, but we can look at the type of crop and what people were growing and, you know, get an idea of whether that would have been something with high THC content or not. And if somebody was growing hemp in a field in England in, you know, the 18th century, I doubt that it would have very much THC content. It'd be probably pretty bunky. You might come up with some sort of alchemical way of extracting what THC there was and compounding it, you know. Uh, um, and there is, you know, in my latest book, I take a look at a lot of alchemical stuff and there was that sort of technology around. Uh, um, but uh, the differentiation is really largely due to hybridizing and uh, what, how you grow it, and what you're growing it for, and where you grow it, and things like that, than any sort of genetic uh, distinguishing. And the genetics happens after you've done that hybridizing. But you could take a, you know, I think, I think you could take even a low quality hemp plant 
and through corrective breeding over generations and generations, bring it back to a, a potent psychoactive plant if you knew what you were doing. And vice versa, you know, you could take a, a stout indica and probably through selective breeding after generations come up with something that was producing a long stock for fiber if that was your goal. But you know, all this type of stuff takes a long, long time. So the Scythians, they grew both kind of? Uh, they I don't think, have... I think they, you know, like uh, they did have hemp cloth, you know what yeah. I mean? Fine hemp yeah. cloth. I don't think that they differentiated. They just grew it and, you know, chopped the buds and threw those on the, on the hot stones and used the stock, you know. Even in, in Vedic liter literature, there's, you know, like uh, uh, references to weaving soma and making a belt, sacred belt out of it, you know. So it was obviously, you know, both, both things have been used and you can use any plant for both things if you really want to. All the qualities are there, but hybridizing spe specifically uh, enhances whatever quality that you're wanting to get out of it. Like the Mar yeah. Now, what's, what's really interesting about this uh, Indo-European Gushi culture and the finds of cannabis there is this has been the highest THC content of cannabis that they have uh, found yet. And uh, it, it's thought that, that Soma actually came from this region, was imported. They talk about the importation taxes and stuff like that in uh, uh, Vedic texts like the Sipatatha Brahma. Uh, um, and uh, um, th they were specifically growing female cannabis buds and picking the seeds out of them before they used it. Oh, so okay. they had really taken things a little further than the, the rural uh, Scythians of, say, the Russian steppes and some of the finds we're finding there. It's pretty rough, uh, low-quality cannabis, I think. You know what I mean? But it's clearly yeah. all part of the same cultural context when you take a look at the uh, utensils used and the method of uh, things, Both in both cases, uh, often uh, um, uh, involved in uh, funerary rituals, you know, rituals for the dead. Yeah. And this is interesting. Uh, because Mersey Eliad, one of the foremost authorities on the history of religion, yeah. has suggested that this may have uh, uh, been a, a form of Scythians acting as psychopomps, guides for the souls of the dead. Yeah. And uh, Eliad noted that we may have come up with a whole idea of a soul that could leave the body after death. Yep. through the use of drugs like cannabis when we have these visionary experiences. You know, yep. we see this in the case of the Zoroastrian figure, Ardu yep. Viraf, who drank, as I mentioned, three uh, golden Cups. cups of cannabis-infused wine and then yep. had this otherworldly voyage where he saw heaven and hell. Yep. And so this is powerful, powerful stuff in the creation of uh, cosmological thoughts. So if, if we have to compare to the modern cannabis that... Uh, the golden cup contains how much milligram of THC? Any, any idea? Well, we're talking about a, a very powerful preparation. Uh, it's thought that this may have been some sort of hash extract and extract of these things. But uh, in the descriptions of these events, uh, uh, the, the figures like Ardu Viraf that, that drank of them are described as being in a comatose state for a, a day or two. And wow. uh, in fact, cannabis was uh, um, the first. Uh, um, Anesthetic, a cannabis infused wine in China was being used like 100 AD to perform complicated operations. And William O'Shaughnessy, when he was in India, he was putting into dogs into still full on states of hibernation with uh, potent uh, uh, um, uh, remedies of cannabis. And a guy in the 19th century, Dr. James Braid, uh, wrote a, a, a track called trance and human hibernation. He was talking about fakirs and holy men in India who would perform this ritual uh, to entertain Westerners where they would say, okay, I'm going to be buried alive for a week and then I'm going to come out of this and you're going to see that I'm still alive. And he okay. believed that they were using some sort of potent cannabis infusion combined with yogic techniques to pull this off. So they were out for a week. I think I, there was, a, uh, while researching, uh, there, I saw the picture where in one sadhu, like he went under for more than a week and then he came out alive. Yeah. They just, there was no air. It, it wasn't a vacuum, but it was. There was it's like it slows you down. Like uh, yeah. uh, uh, William O'Shaughnessy, when he, he described some of the uh, uh, experiments he was doing in India, he describes putting people into a cataleptic state where they're like totally frozen. And they could move their arm, and their arm would just stay like that, and they'd stay like. 
Uh, um, and uh, uh, there's actually an interesting video you can see. This is a very hard state to reproduce, but I have seen one example of this. And there's this video of this kid taking dab. You know, if you do, if you Google uh, dab freeze, you probably find it on YouTube. Uh, okay. But this. Uh, obviously inexperienced young man uh, does a, uh, a a big dab or two of uh, of hashish and he literally freezes in time wow and then they shake him and he comes back i was frozen in time he just starts freaking out it's a pretty amazing phenomena you know and uh, that is something that's a real thing that can can happen around really potent infusions of cannabis so what do you what do you see where cannabis is going in next uh, well say fifty years or hundred years will it be back in use as much as it's oh could? it's already you know like here in in Canada it's like you know my family who was quite concerned about my activism a couple of decades ago was asking me where to get CBD products it's like <laughs> CBD is all over the place man yeah. and uh, the knowledge you know it's a very effective medicine man you take a look at what's happening with epilepsy. Absolutely. Cannabis, man, this is like yeah. a miracle cure for these parents. Epilepsy yeah. was thought to be demonic possession yeah. up, up until like the Middle Ages, right? Yeah. Uh, um, so this is like a really potent, it's the best thing for it, you know? And, and uh, we're finding, you know, you can retard the growth of uh, t t tumors, cancer yeah. tumors, stop the blood flow through them with cannabis. There's all sorts yeah. of really potent uh, uh, information about medical qualities of cannabis and how it interacts with the endocannabinoid system of our body uh, mm -hmm. um, that is just revolutionizing the whole medical field. And people are discovering this, uh, you know, whether governments like it or not. And, uh, you know, what do I see happening with cannabis? Man, I've always been on the same trip. This is a holy mission. This is the return of Soma. This is yep. the tree of life of the book of Revelation. Yeah. This is Absolutely. a holy moment and a holy plan. This is yep. God reaching out to us and giving us a chance. Yep. With our bodies, we can heal this medicine, man. We can make ourselves see when we have glaucoma. We can stop the shaking when we got epilepsy. Yep. Yep. With this plant, we can replace all the trees we cut down for paper. We can replace soil depleting cotton, 50% of the chemicals and pesticides used yep. in agriculture are used on cotton. You don't need those for hemp. Yeah, with I mean, look, nutritious look. seed, we can feed the world, man. Yeah. And with it, we can make fuels like biomass fuels, man. Yeah. Even batteries. This is a miracle. This is the miracle. This is our chance. This is our gift. This is our heritage. Yeah, humanity has to rise up. Look what happened in Australia, right? Australia is burning now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're like so wrapped up in coal. The, the yeah. Australian government wants to make it illegal to try and try, tie in the coal industry with uh, climate change because they're worried about the economic results. And our country burns to the ground. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, and yeah. America right now yeah. is planning a war in Iran where they recently found a huge uh, new stock of oil and it's all about the oil. It's always been about the oil. But it's we have always, plenty, all the Gulf Wars have been about the oil. Absolutely. We have plenty of oil here in Canada. Why don't yeah. they just turn to hemp and then let the farmers run the show, right? Absolutely. And, absolutely. And Mitch yes, McConnell, I've senator. Been yeah. For a long time, you know, people are starting to listen. I don't know if it's going to happen quick enough. You know what I mean? Uh, there's, I, I don't believe that there's a problem out there we don't have a solution for. And cannabis hemp is a, is a big part of a lot of those solutions. It's a matter of implementing them when we have people like uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia and uh, Donald Trump and, and, and people like that in power. It just seems almost impossible to implement it in, in, in the face of that. But who knows, maybe this is going to lead to revolution as, uh, as this world uh, tears apart. This is going to yeah. be an interesting decade. It's going to be a cannabis-filled decade. And, you know, if, if you're listening, man, I advise you to start finding out about cannabis because, you know, say we have a nuclear war or something like that. The only reason cannabis became known as a medicine is because of great effectiveness in chemotherapy, which is basically radiation poisoning. The yeah. nausea and other ailments, the wasting away, this is all the effects of the radiation of the chemotherapy. It's same as the radiation poisoning of, yeah. of, of atomic waste, you know. And uh, in Ukraine, they're growing cannabis, hemp, in wow. Ukraine to leach the radiation and toxic metals, heavy metals out of the soil uh, because that's the best thing for doing that, you know. And this plan is a miracle, man. And you want to embrace that. If you, can, if you don't believe in your governments and you question your religions, man, you check out this plant and you check out what's happening with it. Yeah, but the thing is the brainwashed, 
to destigmatize it, it's a lot of work. People think, okay, then there are there are lobby, the government lobby, oil lobby, the pharma lobby, right? And then they control the government. So you cannot say that, okay, please take a look at it. They're just right well, away. You know, say, you're telling me like 30 years ago when I became an activist here in Canada in British Columbia, there were no other people promoting this plant. Nobody. Yeah. I couldn't find anybody. It was a long time. I started going around to colleges and universities tell them about the hemp paper and the hemp cloth and uh, the hemp seed nutrition. And, you know, I take a look out today and there's like, you know, probably half a dozen dispensaries within a mile of my home and uh, billboards about cannabis yeah. <laughs> on the news every day. And everybody's a cannabis activist now. So, Absolutely. you know, you just start, man, and you're going to find that, that that's the thing. You just latch onto that no matter where you are, no matter yep. what challenge you face. And I promise you, there will be great rewards. Absolutely. So what brought you into this cannabis world? Like, how did you, it like, how did it shine on you that, okay, this is the plan that like, cause you did well, your whole life to it. Religious experience, uh, in 1989, 90, uh, that involved, uh, cannabis and a uh, number of things brought this about. Uh, the first thing was, uh, there had been a, a real travesty of the Roman Catholic church here where they were being exposed for molesting children. And this was in the Mount Couch orphanage in the eighties. And okay. because of that, I thought, well, I got to find out what's going on with this to, to understand it. So I got a Bible and I started reading and I couldn't really get into it. At that time I had a job as a night watchman office in a fish plant, grew okay. cannabis and surfed and stuff. And coinciding right. with this, I found out about industrial hemp. And then okay. a couple of other things happened. Gulf War for not round one started in Iraq and Saddam was being compared to Nebuchadnezzar, the last king of Babylon. Babylon sits in Iraq where yeah. Iraq is now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, he was being compared to Nebuchadnezzar, the last king of Babylon, uh, uh, who overthrew the Jews, you know. And one night I was in this fish plant and I was reading a, a newspaper and they were, had an advertisement for uh, the, 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 the fall of Babylon, Revelations 18 for a sermon some uh, religious figure was giving and they had a picture of tanks and jets behind it. And okay. I thought, I'm going to read the book of Revelation right now. And I read it. Okay. And uh, John in the story, he's given a scroll by an angel. He puts it in his mouth. It tastes as sweet as honey. <laughs> then he swallows it. It turns bitter in his stomach. Okay. And then he begins to prophesy. So I was like, <laughs> what did this guy eat? And then I get a little further and it says he was given much incense to offer along with the prayers of this, the saints and the billowing clouds of incense held the prayers of the saints. And I'm like, that's trippy. And when I got <laughs> to the end of the Bible, it says, on either side of the river of life stood the tree of life, bearing 12 yeah. manners of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. When I read that, I had this powerful experience where light poured into my body. Yeah. And the, the, the voice was that this is cannabis. And these different fruits of this plant were the industrial applications of cannabis we can use to save this world. And the healing of the nations was that all these nations have been involved with cannabis. You know, we take a look at Taoism originates with cannabis. Hinduism and Shiva, the, 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 the whole Kumbha Mela, man, wrapped right up with cannabis. Sikhism yep. and the Nihang Sikhs and the Sukhadun. Yep. Buddhism and Sh uh, Buddha subsisting on one hemp seed a day under the Bodhi tree. Yep. Even in Judaism, Cannabosom, Zoroastrian, the Banga Manga. This yep. is a holy plant and this is a holy, holy work, man. Yep. Thank you so much for doing it. Really, really appreciate it. And I don't have words to say thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. And, thank you. Uh, live long, man. Do the work you, too, you do. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.